Okay, good morning uh, to everybody. We'll go ahead and get started today's class. And so the only thing I want to do today is cover chapter 14. I think we got all the way through 13 last time. We uh, and we're sort of in the, in the section of the class that, that focused primarily on theory. And this is all sort of leading up to the next exam, which is this week. And so uh, I'll cover 14 today. And, and that's this is really in line with where we are in the syllabus. So we're in pretty good shape as far as that goes. And then we'll talk about uh, on, on Wednesday, on Thursday, there'll be an early activity will basically be to talk about the exam. And this will be really your opportunity to, to bring your questions, ask questions. For those who are watching it, either live or on the on the Zoom feed, uh, Zoom video, just you know, feel free to email me if you want. If you want me to go for anything, talk about something, do the graphs or, or modeling up, I'm more than glad to do that. It's really your opportunity to to get with me on uh, things that are uh, unclear and the things need to be um, zoomed in a little bit, then feel free to do that. That's your opportunity to do that. Okay, so what we're, <laughs> what we're gonna do today is just talk about money. Now, obviously this is an important subject in economics. And yet sometimes we oftentimes don't have the right idea of what money actually is because Sometimes we might hear somebody say, oh, you know, so-and-so has got a lot of money. Some star athletes got a lot of money or, or whatever. And, and they, may, they may have a lot of money as money, but it's oftentimes what we're really referring to as wealth. And so that's not really the same thing as money. And so if you consider the fact that we've got a $25, $26 trillion economy, we don't need $25 or $26 trillion moving around because this money can move itself. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that to the very end, this idea that money has velocity. It's, it's recyclable. It's reusable. And it's fungible, and that simply means, I know we've heard the term fungible a lot for anybody who's been involved in crypto. All fungible simply means is that one bit of currency is as good as any other. There's no, there's no higher class of, of money. And so it is it is what it is. Now, we do divide it in two different ways, and so we'll get to that in a second. So when we talk about the definition of money, let me swivel the camera over here a little bit. And these PowerPoints are, are posted on, on the Brightspace site, so you can see them for the week 11 module. Um, the money, the definition of money is basically this. And we didn't get to this last week. We didn't talk about money at all. Anybody? Okay, I didn't think so. <clears throat> it's going to work like my notes because I know there, we have another macro section. You guys are very, very close to, <laughs> to where each other is. Okay, so when we talk about money, what we're saying is we're talking about the fiat system. Now, the term fiat may sound familiar, but it, it more as a sports car rather than a, a system. But it, the fiat simply means it's government provided and it has value simply because government decrees that it has value. In other words, you might say, well, what other kind of money would there be? Well, you could have a, a currency, uh, a metals back uh, system, gold backed by gold, backed by silver. When, our, when the US dollar was first issued back in the 1780s, uh, and there was, it, was, it was backed by a combination of gold and silver and we've gone on and off the gold standard throughout our history, and uh, we, we went on the gold standard, uh, you know, sometime after, before World War, before the Civil War, we often did the Civil War, so the government could create new money. As a result of that, we had lots of inflation, but we said already that, that war is, is sort of a, a source of inflation. It's one of those shocks to the system. Uh, we went back on the gold standard, and, we, and at one point, it was illegal for people, actually ordinary Americans, they actually own gold you know, today, which sounds crazy because we see all these ads on TV after years of, hey, buy gold, it's a good investment and whatnot. And um, but there was one point in time when people couldn't have gold and they could be used for things like, like dental uh, fillings and whatnot, but it, it didn't have, it was a, as a personal use, it did not have, the people didn't have the ability to own it, mostly because uh, the government wanted to make sure that the money supply was backed by gold and so they didn't want people hoarding gold and therefore putting a quarter on the money supply. In 1971, the U.S. went off the gold standard. We've never come back, and I don't think we ever will. Not in the near future. And I know there are people out there who argue for a return to the gold standard, particularly people who say, look, the government's out of control. They're putting too much money. And as a result, we have inflation. Uh, the inflation argument's only really been supported in the last year, 18 months, something like that. But people have been arguing for the gold standard for decades. And really without much proof to back up why it's a good standard. And if you think, consider the fact that there's so much gold in the world, however much money, however much gold there is, it's however much there is. And so unless we find more gold, we either have to tie the money supply growth to the, to the growth in gold, which is difficult. We change the ratio of dollars to gold, which is therefore the question is, what's the point of having gold in the first place? 
<clears throat> or we simply get off the gold standard altogether and simply manage the value of it. That's exactly what we do. So when we say government supplied and legal tender means it's, it is what it is. It's legal for, for different purposes for which it's intended. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And I know this is probably a timely discussion uh, too about the whole idea of the cryptocurrencies, <clears throat> Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum. And there's something like 1,500 different coins out there all the time. And you would sort of think maybe as a logical matter, we would have lost some of these cryptocurrencies simply because of all the problems that have been occurring with FTX and with some of the others. There's one um, cryptocurrency that says, okay, we're back dollar for dollar by US dollars. And so people would say, well, prove it and give you know, have an audit. Oh, no, we can't do an audit. Well, of course you can't do an audit, particularly if you can't prove something. So uh, that to me is a major red flag. And by the way, the people have been saying, Reserve, which is our issue of currency, needs to be audited. Uh, they've been saying that year after year after year, the Federal Reserve has been saying we are audited to the point where, you know, we even have members of Congress saying the Federal Reserve needs to be audited. And the Federal Reserve kept saying, you know, I don't know how many times we need to tell you this, we're audited. At one point, the Federal Reserve put on their website a link to the KPMG web, which is the accounting firm, to the, to the audit site so people can look for themselves. Not that anybody would bother to look at an audit report. No, that's that's too difficult to do. But you get the idea that there's all this 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 uh, mythology about money and the idea that crypto is somehow some sort of magic solution and that our government is somehow out of control, which I doubt you could really say. I mean, certainly we've all got beefs with government. No one thinks our government's perfect, but even our government doesn't think it's perfect. But the idea of, of replacing money with something that's slowly ballooning, which is really what crypto is, frankly. And it's not backed by anything. And if anybody can create money and by saying, okay, here's digital money, send me your, and by the way, how do you get the digital money? You got to give your real, you can buy the stuff and then you can name it for real money. That doesn't sound like a, any kind of currency that I'm familiar with. So, so when we're talking about this, we're talking about government supplied notes. We're not going to really get into crypto because it's not really money. And I'm actually sort of surprised that it's even legal. Um, the only government that I'm aware of that's really taken steps to deal with it is the Chinese government, but that's not exactly the model of government that I think we ought to sort of emulate because they're doing it because they, you know, basically want to have a monopoly on most important things, including money. But I do think that they're probably way ahead of the US. What's even more disheartening for those of us who think that crypto is you kind know, of a fool's errand, and I think it is really, and I think I, I, I would be shocked if I'm not right on this. Um, one bit of evidence uh, for this is, is the fact that, um, what was I going to say? Uh, well, I mean, forget what I was going to say, but I mean, there's, there's evidence, ample evidence that, that this is, is really not going to work, I think. And so I lost my train of thought there. But uh, so I think that it's, it's been sort of leading us down the, uh, uh, down the oh, one, one bit of, I know what I was going to say was what was disheartening is the fact that our government is actually its own cryptocurrency. President Biden has said, look, I don't know what we do about this crypto, but we, so he commissioned the Federal Reserve and the Treasury to do something, study it, find out what to do about it, and the solution appears to be that the Federal Reserve is going to come up with its own uh, digital currency, which I don't really understand, and it's not happened yet, so I guess we'll find out what does happen. So anyway, I, the only reason I give into that little bit of side sidecar is because there's been so much criticism of the money supply and of the management of the money supply, that there are people who firmly believe that cryptocurrency is the way of the future. And I don't think that's going to be the case. I mean, if it were the way of the future, why wouldn't everybody insist on being paid in that? Instead, good old money is pretty good, even though it's not backed by gold and silver. We accept it. The reason we accept it is because we have faith. We have faith in the government to control the value. And when we lose the faith in that, then obviously we have all kinds of problems and we get an inflationary condition. The African state of Zimbabwe has been for many decades now the sort of exemplar of a state that's not got control of its money supply and inflation rate is in tens of thousands of percent per year, hundred thousands of percent per year. I don't even know what it is now because mostly people have given up on that government to support the value of the currency. And so they mostly deal in euros and dollars, whatever they, whatever it's considered to be, whatever's available, but not the Zimbabwean dollar, which is worth really a so money is money supported by government. So sometimes, though, when we talk about money as opposed to wealth, uh, because I think it's important we say someone has money, we may be saying they have wealth in the form of real estate, investments, and things like that. Let's talk about money as money. Sometimes it's better to describe what something does rather than what it is. And so let's talk about the four uses of money. Really, it, for most, if you look at most textbooks, you really have three main uses. 
And I'm really going to focus primarily on these first two. This fourth one, your text brings it up, so I go ahead and, and include it, even though I don't know that you know, a lot of people would, would consider it to be anything other than, than one of the three. You can sort of, depending upon the use of the standard of per payment, it can be jumped into one of these three categories. But I put it on there just so you've got it, so it matches with what your text has. And so the first of these, and probably the one that we know the most um, intimately, because the very first interaction we have with money is, it's a medium of exchange. Okay, so obviously we buy something with money, and so it's and we, we get paid in money, we buy things with money. So it's it's a very simple way of, of organizing our economy. But what looks like a fairly simple idea is actually it took a long time to sort of work its way out to become something as modern as what it is today. Because prior to the existence of money, there was this there was the barter problem. Now, what's the barter problem? Well, bar well, any kind first of all, any kind of barter transaction is, as we probably know. A transaction of goods for goods or goods for services or some sort of goods and services back and forth. There's no money intermediary going on here. And so the problem with the barter, and there's something called a double coincidence of once with the barter problem. And what that simply means is that if I've got something I want to get to acquire, uh, I've got to find somebody who's got it, first of all. But then coincidentally, I have to have something that they want. That's a real problem, um, you know, in an era in which, there, even in an era where there weren't that many modern goods, where most of the goods were agricultural in nature and household-based, things like clothing and farm implements and things like that, it still was difficult to find somebody who had what you want, who coincidentally wanted what you what you had to, to provide. And then the issue is, what is it worth? What is uh, What are 10 chickens worth? One horse, or it probably doesn't sound like a fair trade, maybe a thousand chickens for one horse, I don't know. Uh, and the fact that, that probably a lot of people didn't know. And so as a result, you had this weird system that didn't really make sense. And so where paper money came from in the first place, uh, when say after people said, so gold has been used for very long time, for centuries. And the reason gold was, was important, and the reason why I think a lot of people are still sort of attracted to it, and I'm not even talking about cryptocurrency, I'm talking about gold and silver and precious metals. The gold in particular, gold is one of those, those rare Elements in the universe that you can't destroy. You, if you heat it, melt it, it will just go back to its, its, its previous form. It doesn't evaporate. It doesn't rust. It doesn't do, it, it just doesn't go away. It's, it's got an unlimited life. And if you ever have seen like on the Discovery Channel or whatever, like King Tut's tomb where King Tut's got this gold thing around his body, it's, it looks just as modern today as it did you know, 2,500 years ago or whenever King Tut lived. And that's what gold does. And so there's no, there's no uh, uh, surprise as to why gold was accepted as a medium of exchange. But here's the big problem with gold, is it's scarce. So as a result, what happened, paper money originated with goldsmiths. People deposited their gold, didn't want to carry it around. So they would store it and give them a receipt. That receipt then would be the first form of paper money. And so today, we don't think anything about it. We use that as a means of, of escaping the borrowed problem. That's the first major issue that we, uh, first major use. The second use is just the, it's really sort of the opposite transaction. Now remember, if we go back to the income approach in computing GDP, this takes us back to chapter six. We started out with GDP and we worked our way down to national income and then to, we had all these categories where government's collecting taxes like tariffs and indirect business taxes and whatnot. And then we come down to personal income, which is the income earned by households, free tax, and we take out there's personal income taxes will be arrived at disposable income. And what do we say about disposable income? There are only two things you could do with it. One, you could spend it or you can save it. So this is essentially and it's in, in the form of dollars, right? And if we're talking about some other economy, maybe it's the Canadian dollar or the British pound or the euro, it's the same situation. Um, everybody can do it, just different currencies act by, by dish, by, issued by different governmental authorities. So either spend it or save it, spend it or save it. And we're talking about here saving in its present form. So here is what, what is confusing to some, and I, I bring this up only because sometimes I have a little bit wrong, and that is the idea we're talking about saving in its present state, not converting it to some other asset like a, uh, like a bond or a stock or real estate or something, all of which are stores of value in terms of wealth, but they're not monetary stores of value. They're, 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 they're accounted for in terms of money, but they're not money itself. You can't say a house or an office building or a farm is, is money. It's, I mean, even though people say, well, there's money in that farm. Well, there is, but it's, but it's not really money, as we know. We're talking about money as money when we talk about second use that as a store of value. 
meaning that you can spend it or save it, and then save it as present form. You can come back and get it at some point in the future to retrieve it, and then convert that to spending if you want to do that. Now, I know there's there's one issue with the store of value, and that's particularly during inflationary times, particularly during inflationary times, but really any time, and that is the idea that if our money is losing value over time, which frankly is in all in all occasions, but especially during inflationary times, then do you really want to store money as money unless you're being paid a rate of return commensurate with that? And it's only been the last really several weeks, I think, the banks have started to really catch up with the, the whole interest rate environment. I mean, I kind of follow this pretty closely, and I, and I know CD rates were lagging, lagging, lagging. That's certificate of deposit rates. We'll, we'll talk more about what those are here shortly. Um, and banks have been really sort of reluctant to do that. And so a lot of people have not been putting their money in, in the banks so much, which is why this whole bank failure thing of, of uh, Silicon Valley Bank is a little bit surprising, but it's not too surprising. And by the way, it's not a sign of, I don't think of some sort of economic weakness, or and I think it's a sign of poor regulation, frankly, because you know this bank was allowed to 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 not match up the, the maturities of its assets, that is, its bond portfolio, with its liabilities, which are its deposits. And so, as a result, that was a trouble waiting to happen. And we'll talk a bit more about that whole equation as we get into it. So, spend it or save it. Okay. And then the third is a unit of account. That's the idea that we measure things in terms of dollars. Okay. It's what we call the yardstick of value. And so we, we track assets, liabilities. Those are balance sheet items for businesses or individuals, theoretically. You can have balance sheet. Uh, assets are essentially defined as things which are owned, liabilities, things which are owned. I know the accounting world, if you take an accounting, they've got a little more comprehensive definition that an asset is something which is created as a result of past transactions or past events and its future service value. So I know that that's, when I say it's something that's owned, it's a little bit of shorthand. I realize there's a, a more formal definition, but it's good enough for our purposes. And we're going to talk more about assets and liabilities in a second. Liabilities are things which are owed than income, expenses, and profits. Profit is a business term concept only. So the three actors in the circular flow model, the only entity that earns profits is businesses. Even though we sometimes say, just we're you know, speaking out of hand, oh, hey, I profited from this particular thing because I sold a stock and gain. That's that's fine. That's you know, I guess you can consider it profit, but unless you're in the business of selling stocks to get to make a gain, it's not really considered profit. It's a business uh, concept. Okay. All right. And then the fourth one is the standard of deferred, of deferred payment, and that is money flows in the future are measured whether money flows in, money flows out, whether it's at the private sector level, businesses and you know, financial institutions, or whether it's a government. It's simply a measure by which we, we uh, and usually we discount that because a dollar today is worth, is worth more than a dollar in the future. So as a result, we sort of we will discount those future flows one way or another. And so these are the, the uses of money. So sometimes it makes sense to talk about these in terms of what they, what they are, in terms of what they do rather than what they are. Okay, so questions about that so far. This is pretty straightforward, I know. There's not anything that's really too, uh, you know, too outlandish just yet, okay? Supply, which we'll simply call S sub N. And I, I don't recall, I guess I should have looked, I didn't, I didn't neglect to do so. In your textbook, what the authors uh, used as the sort of algebraic symbol for the money supply, I just have used S sub N for a long time. It could be sometimes text we use SM, MS. I mean, it just, it, it's whatever. It's the same thing. It's just the symbol may differ. Uh, it'd be really nice if we all sort of agreed on what we're going to call that, what we're going to label things, but they are the same thing. So there are two components of the money supply, okay? And by the way, when I told you a second ago that I'm going to focus on the first two uses, there's a reason for that because they directly tie into the money supply. And then when we come back to our third discussion, and we'll talk about the, the demand for money, which I know sounds like it's, it's got to be infinite, but it really isn't because the demand for money is a little bit is a little bit different <clears throat> than what we would maybe think of as intuitively. Okay, so the money supply is basically made up of two components. Now, by the way, it hasn't been all that long ago. In fact, we had textbooks that people were still bringing to class. You know, maybe they were their older brother or sister had it, and so sometimes people say, "Hey, you know, can I use this textbook? Uh, I don't really want to go pay another hundred and some dollars." And I say, "Yeah, it's okay, but." There are probably some things that are wrong. Macro, you could probably get away with it. There's not much change. Macro, though, this has changed. So you got any kind of source you see 
And it's M, not just M1, M2, but M3, M4, because those used to exist. And then, and then one step further, something called L. And so those are outdated terms. It's only been maybe the last 10 or, 10 or 12 years that we've done, whittled this down to two. But it makes sense. And, it, and it's, it's actually logical that we have divided into two areas. And so the first thing is it's called M1. Now, by the way, M1 is a subset of M2. So everything in M1 goes to M2. So it basically fits in as a subset. M1 is the most liquid component of the money supply. And when we say the term liquid, all we simply mean is the term liquid everywhere that, that we are, the ability to convert something to cash. Well, obviously one big component of M1 is cash itself. So if it's already in that, that present form. So it clearly is about as liquid as you get. Coin, same thing, cash coin, checkable deposits. Now, why don't we say checkable deposits? Why don't we just say checking accounts? Wouldn't that be easier? Well, not really, because this is a little more comprehensive because uh, credit unions offer checkable account deposits. They're just not called checking accounts. Credit unions are a little bit of an animal. They're very similar to banks. You probably wouldn't even know the difference if you're a customer. One difference is though the checking account is known as a share draft account typically, because theoretically, the owners or the, the, the depositors are owners of the credit union. And that's more of a sort of a legal fiction than it is anything else. But nonetheless, there, there are no owners other than, I mean, if there's nobody to own it, then it's got to be owned by the by the customers. And so when you're drawing a check on your bank account on the credit union, you're, you're, you're drafting against your share of the ownership theoretically. And when I say it's more methodological, I mean, just like insurance companies are owned, mutual insurance companies are owned by their customers. Um, and, and State Farm, if you have car insurance with State Farm, like I've had for years, um, I don't really feel like I'm a owner of State Farm. And nobody calls me and says, hey, what's your opinion on this? Right? I mean, it's, so it's, it's a little bit of a legal, um, a legal fiction. But not only, the only reason I bring up checkable deposits as opposed to checking is because that exists. Also, some savings accounts have checkable privileges where you can write checks off of a savings account to the point where now we have to wonder, is there a big difference between checking and savings. And at one time there was, and it was really well enforced by the government. In fact, one of the portions of M2, that is the non-M1 portion of M2 was important, was this idea of time deposits or even savings accounts. And at one time the federal government had for many decades, from about, oh gosh, the 1930s to about the early mid eighties, there was a regulation called Regulation Q, which mandated what rate of interest the banks would pay on savings accounts. It had to be, it was like five and a quarter percent. And that was it. You couldn't go higher. You couldn't go lower. It had to be that. And, and all of this needed to be some sort of, it, all of that needed to be modernized through deregulation. And I know when we think about deregulation today, particularly finance, the very mix, it really is. And uh, well served in some cases, particularly in removing some of these really, really outdated depression era um, regulations, which don't make any sense at all. It hadn't, hadn't made sense for many decades. Some of the, the crazier things to go on, like subprime lending is, you know, that's maybe not so good. And um, but I think that maybe, uh, I, I don't keep saying this, but I really think crypto is a tipping, tick, ticking time bomb. And uh, I think if, uh, if you have any advice, go ahead, but just to keep your eyes open. And if you lose money, then, you know, don't come to me <laughs> because I don't think you're gonna be probably all gonna it's all gonna go away at some point. That, in fact, I just think it's gonna. I think thing and all these innovations in finance uh, tend to not really go nowhere. It's the only it's the only profession I can think of that, that people always come in with brand new stuff and say the world is different. All the world everything's changed, and so you know um, everything's different. I mean, if what, what if your dentist said, "Hey, you know, we have it all wrong. Chocolate is okay. You can eat candy. We had it all wrong in the first place." You know? Everything you know is wrong. Well, I think we'd be kind of worried about that dentist. But we have no problem with people in the financial industries coming up with these new these these new products. So, so anyway, I, br I bring up the idea of regulation because there's a, a bit of deregulation discussion in your book. I'm not really going to get into. It. I used to, I did time in this class to do it, um, and, and I know that the financial crisis that began in 2008. Oftentimes, it's sort of laid at the doorstep of the, the entire deregulation movement, but we're not going to really get into that. Instead, I want to focus on some of the, the key elements of here. That's M1 and M2. So M1 is the most liquid component, cash coin, checkable deposits. These are very liquid. What we would call open open deposits, that is accounts you can get at very quickly 
that, had, that do pay a rate of interest. And I, I say this is not interest bearing form, but really these things don't really pay that much interest. In fact, they don't even really catch up with inflation at all. So, and we know that money sitting in your in your uh, checking account or in your in your pocket does not earn interest. And so this tends to be non interest bearing form. We've also got traveler's checks. Traveler checks are, are kind of a, a, a unique thing. And I'm, I'm a little surprised that they're not used as much as what they, they used to be. The, the good thing about traveler's checks is that wherever you are in the world, if you've got like an American Express traveler's check or a Visa traveler's check, if you lose it, which people do lose stuff when they're, or have it stolen, all you need to do is call American Express and they'll just come to your hotel and bring you new money right away. That's It's easy to do. And there are parts of the world in which people get robbed all the time. It happens all the time. So if they steal your money, it's gone, obviously. If they steal your credit card, well, it might take a little bit of time to get there. But I'm a little surprised traveler's checks aren't, aren't more in use. But they're really not. But they're still out there. And so as a result, they are part of M1. Okay? M2, all of M1 fits into M2. M2, which is the non-M1 portion, is less liquid and is composed of, all, again, all of M1 because it's cumulative. And time deposit accounts, these are, they're called time simply because you commit the funds to a certain time period, you can't get at them. You can withdraw only with a, a penalty that usually means you forfeit a lot of the interest that you would have earned. And as a result, um, sometimes you are actually worse off if you take an early withdrawal from a, a time deposit. And we're thinking primarily certificates of deposit, which, you know, I mean, people used to talk a lot about CDs, not so much anymore, mostly because it's been many, many years since they paid rates of return that were even attractive, and they're only, only now starting to get better. Um, but it's, it's only been really just in the last few weeks because inflation rates ticked up, the Federal Reserve's been raising rates, and really banks, not surprisingly, I guess, are slow to sort of push those rates up. And, and I know that I've been reading, if you've been watching some of any of the, the news, just the regular news, not even the financial news, there's all this talk about, hey, people are not going to trust banks anymore after this. Well, I don't know why you wouldn't trust a bank because you know maybe they they do they get involved in some crazy lending, but that doesn't affect you if you're a depositor. It's none of your business, really, because you are FDIC insured, and so you'll get your money back. And by the way, all these depositors in in Salt Bank that failed, they got all their money back, and they were way, way, way over the limit of FDIC insurance. But the government decided to make make them whole, and they did it not because they were deserving of it. Because a lot of the were investment firms just simply chasing a little bit of higher yield on, on these things here. And, you know, most people don't feel very sorry for hedge funds. And I think it's probably right, too, because these are grownups who, you know, are out to make money. And that's the only occupation they have is to make money with, with money. Uh, but what I'm saying is that everyone's paid off, even the ones who are in the risk business altogether. So you don't have to to worry about putting your money in the bank. As long as you don't exceed the FDIC limits, but and I know we've been talking within our department about are these limits even effective? This two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit because if thousands of dollars in, in this bank that failed, they got all paid back, and that's so what? So I don't know if the limit is actually that that important, but all that does though is sort of serve to bolster people's confidence in banks, and I think that we could feel pretty good about that. So money has money sitting in banks. So when we talk about what the money supply. Like basically you're saying you've got something like this. You've got all of M1, and then M2 is sort of a subset of that. So all of M2 fits into M1. Basically, like a Venn diagram here. I don't know if you guys could see that on the video that, that clearly, but uh, you're talking about simply a talking about simply what is a subset of one thing. There's a very similar sort of diagram in your book. So it's uh, all of M1 fits into M2. So all of M1 is in M2, but not all of M2 is in M1. It's the other way around. Okay, so, and, and the M2, that is the non-M1 portion of M2, tends to be interest-bearing. By interest-bearing, I simply mean you paid a rate of return on it, and so as a result, it's a different animal. Now, why did we, why was this cut down? Because I said earlier that we had an M1, 2, 3, 4, and pretty much all of M3 and M4 were sort of dumped into M2, and there's a reason for that. And that is because of the fact that, number one, it sort of correlates more closely to these uses of money. So if we take a look at this, and by the way, I'll... I'll revisit this, this notion here when we come back to, um, where's my eraser? When I, when I come back to the demand for money, do I have an eraser? Oh, there was <clears throat> sort of a panic here. I didn't have an eraser here. When we come back to the demand for money, which we're not going to get to this particular part of the course, uh, we'll talk about how this also lines up. So if we have um, 
the uses of money. Okay, so let me zoom in here a little bit. Okay, so if we have the uses of money, we've got a medium exchange, right? That's a pretty obvious one, obviously. And then we've got money as a store of value. Now, I know there are two others, I get that, but these are the two most important by far. Medium exchange and store of value. Well, these are basically associated with, and I'm not going to say they're equal to, they're associated with basically uh, money is in the form of M1, associated with money in the form of M1, um, not including M2, not including M1. Okay, store of value. And, and this makes sense if you think about it. Obviously, what would you need money in the form of M1 for, right? That is, why would you have money on you? Why would you put money in your checking account because you're prepared to spend it or to pay bills, pay immediate expenses, and so as a result, that's an exchange. Even paying a bill is simply a medium exchange, okay? So as a result, you would put money in that form in order to hold that. If you don't need to spend it right away, you just want to hold on to it, you use it as a store of value. You might typically put it in some sort of M2, even if it's a very short maturity, in order to earn a little bit of interest, a little bit of return. And there are cases in which people just have a little bit of extra money for whatever reason, maybe they get a bonus or an extra big commission or whatever. And they just simply want to hold on to it. They don't want to invest for long term. They don't want a 10 year CD, but they want to earn a little bit of interest. And so as a result, they'll put it in something like an M2 vehicle. And by the way, I keep talking about banks here, and banks are really the essential intermediary in the economy. And we're going to talk a lot more about them here in a second. And we'll talk about why they're important and why there's so much attention paid. So if you have been watching the news, obviously we had three banks that went under in the last uh, what couple of weeks now. And of course, there's been lots of hullabaloo about what this means. What what does all this what does this all this mean? And I think it doesn't, unless it's a bigger problem throughout the, the system, I don't think it means all that much, especially to, to depositors. They're being paid in full. I think the only thing that, that inconvenienced them was the bank was shut down on Friday and they had to wait till Monday to get their money out. For those who weren't fortunate enough to get their money out ahead of time, because this was a full-fledged bank run. When it came to Silicon Valley Bank, and it was it was it was said to be the world's first internet-inspired bank run, right? where everyone was on Twitter and and uh, and emailing each other saying, "Get your money out of Silicon Valley Bank; it's going to fail." But if you knew you were over the two hundred fifty thousand dollars FDIC limit, you probably had a lot of good reasons to get your money out. But that's the problem when everyone wants their money out, because if everybody wants their money out of the bank at the same time, that bank is going to fail because it isn't there. Because all this money that you put in deposit. You know, it's not sitting in a, in a shoebox in the vault with your name on it. It's been loaned out or it's been invested. And usually we say that, well, the bank investments are probably about as good as cash because they can simply sell them. The problem that these banks had, and certainly Silicon Valley Bank, was the fact they were investing in very long-term securities and the, the prices of those, the value had fallen. And in order for them to, to sort of redeem those, they, have to they had to recognize losses right away. And that's when the whole... Bank run began was when people started making withdrawals and they had to start, you know, moving money out of these, these long-term uh, accounts. And by doing it, they had to recognize losses. So it was like $1.8 billion loss in like one the last quarter of last year. And then the whole thing got rolling. And so I know my very first day in banking, we we were all of us were new mortgage uh, management trainees and, and, and senior executives said, okay, a bank is a house of cards at the end. That's what you need to know. And of course, we all thought, okay, whatever. <laughs> really, I mean, really, I mean, it's a bank. What, you know, banks at that time really hadn't failed since the Great Depression. It was kind of we always thought of, we thought of it as sort of an historical anomaly. There, are, banks aren't going to fail anymore. But in reality, banks can and, and do fail. And in fact, if you consider the financial system is very fragile in general, I think we need to be aware of that um, because whenever we have these economic problems, that a lot of times they stem from the financial world which is fragile by definition. I mean, you're only talking about a system. I mean, if you talk about a bank being a house of cards, in effect, and if you start pulling out pieces of the cards, the thing will collapse and the people want their money out. It's not there. It's, it's been loaned out or it's been invested. Usually the investing part is not a problem, but this bank, Silicon Valley Bank in particular, made a fundamental error and that was investing in the wrong securities that did not match their very short-term money. They're investing in long-term securities. They simply... In order, because the value of those had fallen because we issued a time when interest rates were very low. And so people don't want those low yielding bonds. They want higher yielding bonds. And so they're willing to pay less for them. So meaning that if you're holding them, 
That's one of the problems. Remember, that's one of the problems we said about inflation, that the value of long-term contracts is diluted, which it is, and they had to recognize losses. That's what started the whole thing. So it's one, one way to look at banks is that they're, they're a house of cards inherently. There's no, even the biggest and best capitalized of banks is a house of cards. And they're really propped up by nothing more than the popsicle sticks of regulation, government regulation. And, uh, and by the way, if you need evidence of that, Credit Suisse has also just bailed in the last few days. This is a major, major, major Swiss bank. And um, you know, it's, it's a bank that I am shocked has gone under because it looks like they're gonna be sort of absorbed by their, their vicious competitor, UBS, you know, Union Bank, they've been they've been like Coke and Pepsi, and you know, uh, you know against each other for forever. And now they're going to be together in one. We'll, have, we'll see how that goes. That will be interesting to see. That's like uh, you know, Apple buying Microsoft or the other way around, kind of oil and water to say the least. So that'll be interesting. So anyway, these are these are definitely associated one with the other in terms of those uses. Okay. So questions about any of this? Well, let's talk about banks because. Banks are an essential part of the economy, and I think it's very important. And I know that the during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, we had um, President Obama had, had nominated a group of very experienced uh, regula ex-regulators and economists, academics, and whatnot to say, "Look, let's sort of figure out, let's do a post-mortem on this whole thing, and find out what's going on." And we had a former Federal Reserve Chairman named Paul Volcker, who was really esteemed by that time. He was really credited with heavy stuff. The runaway inflation that began in the 1960s and went all the way through the 1980s. And he might have done it with a little bit of hitting the brakes a little bit too hard, I think, in hindsight, but he nonetheless changed inflation expectations. And so one of the things that he said, Volcker, to President Obama, was that the bank that banks, commercial banks, are really the heart of the financial system. And I know that we've got all these competing entities out there like mutual funds, investment firms, insurance companies, hedge funds, all these different, you know. Uh, different vehicles, but you've got to really protect the function of banks. If for no other reason, not because they're worthy of it, um, not because bankers are worthy, but rather they they fulfill a fundamental role macroeconomically. Okay, and that's really the issue there, because I know that during the, the financial crisis of 2008, when a lot of banks were bailed out, and they weren't bailed out by the government, a lot of people said, including a lot of people in politics, hey, Wall Street got bailed out, where's Main Street's bailout? Well, it's not really the right question to ask because number one, they really weren't bailed out, really. I mean, it wasn't done probably the best way possible. I mean, I know there were a lot of there's a lot of consternation over the fact that a lot of these banks that were bailed out went ahead and paid bonuses to executives. But as they said, look, we can't abrogate a private agreement. This is a contract we entered into, just like we can't tell a depositor you can't have your money back. We can't tell an employee that they're not going to get paid what they're due. And I know a lot of people thought that was wrong. But think about it, if you're the employee and you're to that money, right? I mean, you wouldn't like if somebody tried to take your page simply because your bank ran into, or your employer ran into problems. You had nothing to do with it, right? You had absolutely nothing to do with it. And you were doing it. Yeah, I mean, it was, a lot of it was controversial. But the, the key thing is Wall Street really wasn't bailed out. And by the way, the investors lost money in the investment firms that went down and the, and the banks that went down. They, well, their investment went to zero. So you really can't say in all cases it was a bailout. You really can't. Some were bailed out. The investors were, were fine in the long run because they were considered to be what is, was called too big to fail. That is, banks which are too large and can't be taken down because it has too many effects on the economy. Which is why we always jump in and try to bail out uh, banks. Not because those bankers are necessarily deserving. And by the way, the, the investors in Silicon Valley Bank, their investment is going to go to zero. I'm talking about the shareholders. Not the depositors, the shareholders, their investment's going to go to zero. Same with uh, Signature Bank and probably, well, I don't know about Republic Bank. You know, I don't think we know what's happening there. I think there's still some discussion going on about what to do with that. And, and so, and I know that we've been thinking for a long time, okay, there are others. That's the first shoe. We've got other banks coming along to fail. Maybe we do, and maybe we don't. I, I really don't know. And one of the things I can tell you is banks are very reluctant to talk about their problems publicly because it's, you know, you can get a bank run going and a bank run is just simply wherever it wants their money out, the bank fails. And so nobody wants that. So when, when Paul Volcker talked about the fact that we've got to protect the core, the core of the financial system is banks. He really meant the fact that if you don't, you've got bigger macro problems than whatsoever, than whatever. Even if you don't think bankers are the smartest uh, economic actors in general. And, uh, and I think that they, they prove that a lot of times because they, they end up doing some really silly things. 
But and, and, and the best explanation for why that happens is Jamie Diamond, who's the chairman of JP Morgan, said in front of Congress, the reason we do things like this is because if our competitors are doing something like subprime lending, we've got to do subprime lending. Why should we let them take all the business in that area? We don't like subprime lending either, apparently. So subprime lending with these mortgage loans to people who probably weren't qualified. And uh, you know, they were lying about their income, they were being encouraged to lie by their originators. Lots of problems. We could, you know, if you want to look into that, you can certainly do that. But instead, we, the key thing to know is that the first, the corp issue financially in the economy, uh, which finance is different than economics, has to do with money and liquidity. You know, these functions are deposit function, credit function, payments function, and then serving as a, a, an agent of government policy. Let's talk about what these are. So the, the, the deposit function is, is the most basic. Now, by the way, when I when I say commercial banks, let's let's say what we mean here. And what do I mean by a commercial bank? Why do we put that adjective on there? Well, if you know anything about where banks originated, that they primarily, up until maybe World War II and after that, banks really did not deal a lot with ordinary individuals. <clears throat> because you, I mean, you could probably walk in and open an account. But mostly ordinary individuals used a financial intermediary mostly for savings. And banks really weren't in the savings business. They were mostly in to the M1 portion and which is what, what companies, commercial, that's why it's called commercial banks, were really needing was to be able to write checks and pay invoices and, and receive checks from, from customers and whatnot. And so as a result, commercial banks mostly dealt with deposits of businesses and loans to businesses. And ordinary individuals tended to go to more than the savings and loan industry and savings banks and credit unions, which basically those are collectively known as thrifts. They, that industry has mostly been consolidated into commercial banking because we know, all of us know, you can walk into a bank, any bank can open an account. There's no problem with that. But they, uh, I think they had the standoffish, uh, uh, this sort of standoffish view among a lot of people because they really weren't looking for a very long time to deal with ordinary people. Their business was to deal with, with uh, very individual, with, with businesses. So the deposit function has changed over time, but it's a, a very key function. And that is we simply put money on deposit for whatever period of time in some sort of interest-bearing or non-interest-bearing form. The second of these is the credit function. So here's the here's how the process works. So we talk about um, the, the process of liquidity of banks. And I know that I, I'll have to swivel the camera over here in a minute. It's just one of the uh, one of the features of this attend anywhere. But when you make a deposit into a bank, and, I, and we all know that, that banks lend people's money out, but what is the process by which this happens here? What is the, I guess the license is going to come up. Okay. That's weird. Okay. Well, I don't know what to do. Let me see. These are just... <clears throat> My television. There we go. Okay. All right. So, what we talked about the process is I think most of us are aware that if we borrow money from the bank, we're actually borrowing from someone else's savings, which we are. Okay. That's, that's, there's no question. But what is the process by which this is created? Okay, so first of all, we need to um, talk about what these definitions are of a bank, okay? And let me, it's okay, bear with me here for guy, people in the room. So if you, put, if you put money on deposit, so, if, so you put money on deposit, it doesn't go straight to credit, right? Instead, deposits go first to a place called reserves, okay? Which is basically an asset account, and I'll get into this more here in a second. It goes to reserves. And from there, it really goes off into two main areas. It goes off into loans, and it goes off into investments. And when we talked about Silicon Valley Bank, it's a little bit of an unusual thing because when banks do fail, it's either because people are yanking their deposits out. But that's pretty rare. I mean, we really had, during, even during the last financial crisis, which was a full-blown financial crisis, I think there was only one bank that had a full-blown bank, and that was Washington Mutual, and the bank was bailed out by the government and it's no longer exists and shut down. But before that, it was just a bank, which was so weird. It's usually, it's historically it's been that. Typically, when it's a fail, it's because of bad loans. And that was really the heart of the, of the, the subprime crisis. All the other banks, with the exception of Washington Mutual, but I think the reason people were yanking the deposits out is because Washington Mutual was a very big subprime lender. And the word was kind of out on them. And so when the word gets out that the bank is going to fail, it's like that Jimmy Stewart movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Everybody goes to the bank and wants their money out. 
Uh, but it's usually bad loans. It's not runs on banks primarily. Um, what's interesting about Silicon Valley Bank is it really wasn't a problem with loans, it was a problem with investments. And that's practically unheard of. And the reason why this went down was because of the fact that these investments, you know, the reason they were losing value is because they were bought at a time when interest rates were much lower. And when those rates went up, those holdings became less valuable. And as it became less valuable, they had to mark down the value of their investments. That is, take a loss in their in their income, and then as a result, um, people started to panic. And had they not panicked, that bank would probably still be here. And nobody would know anything about it. But this is the process. Okay, this is the process. And so it's important for us to to look, take a look at a bank's balance sheet. Okay, so let's do that. Let's look at what a bank's balance sheet looks like. What is balance sheet? Balance sheet is basically. A um, it's sometimes called a statement of condition and whatnot. You've got really two very broad categories. If you've had accounting before, you will have already seen this. You'll think, okay, this is all familiar, and it is. And I'm not. This is not an accounting course. And we'll talk about. We usually have assets on the left side or above liabilities. There's liabilities, and to balance that, presumably the value of assets exceeds the value of liabilities. So equity is the residual value. That's what, what the balance is. Typically, assets are worth more than liabilities, but this is why it's called a balance sheet is because both sides have got to equal. All right, what's the process? You take your paycheck to a bank, you make a deposit. So deposits become a major liability of a bank, okay? It's the major liability of a bank. And, and by the so in other words, you hope they consider it to be their liability because you want that money back out at some point, right? So as a result, that it becomes a liability of the bank. And then what does the bank do? They immediately yeah, let's say you deposit a paycheck, and it's a thousand dollars, right? So thousand dollars deposits go up, but it also creates a thousand dollar balance over here in what's called reserves. A reserve is an asset to a bank, and so a deposit to a bank is both an asset and a liability. It's both an asset and liability. And if you think about it, um, I know that some of the talking heads on TV have talked about how can you mess up banking. It's the simplest formula for making money there is. And I don't, I've heard that a couple of times. I don't know that I totally agree with it because it's a little more complicated than that. But I do get the point. Somebody brings you their paycheck or whatever, they sell a house and they make a deposit and immediately becomes your money to do whatever you are legally able to do with it. Whatever you want to do. I mean, there's some limitations that banks can do with your money. They can't invest in things like commodity futures and they can't buy farmland and things like that, but they can, they can invest mostly in terms of investments. So they do channel in those two areas, loans and investments. Okay. And so presumably the rate of return on this is something greater than the rate of return paid to this. If there's a rate of return at all paid to this, because a bank would love to not anybody, anything for, for what they bring them in terms of money, but obviously they, they know they have to, but presumably they earn more, so this is why loan rates are higher than deposit rates, obviously, right? I mean, you can't get a, a deposit rate that exceeds your car loan rate, typically. I mean, if you do, I want to know where that is because that's how banks make money. So this idea that, hey, how do banks mess this up? Well, it makes it up in a number of ways. It's not usually the deposit area, which is why I say these runs of deposits are pretty rare. It's usually making bad loans where people simply don't pay. Maybe got to mark those off. And, and yet, if they do that, they still owe the depositor the original money they made on deposit. That's why it's a loss. So this is not particular rocket science society. People don't pay you back, you take a loss, right? But that's the main, that's the main system. That's the main formula of ours to have. So credit is simply a, a function that is derived from the deposit function. The third function is the payments function. The payments function is, the, is, is tied very intimately into the deposit function. But here's what's different about this. There tends to be, there's oftentimes some sort of fee-based element to the, um, to the payments function. We say that banks primarily make money on the spread between what they earn here and what they pay here. But they also make money in terms of fees because they do things like wire transfers or handle payments for other third parties. They typically collect a fee and that's money that is just free money from doing whatever it is they do. And they maintain systems like wire transfer systems and check clearing and whatnot more efficient than ever. In fact, the idea of physical checks is really almost outdated. And I, I am wondering whether or not there will even be physical checks in 20 years or so, because even today you go to a lot of places, you write a check and they just immediately convert it to electronic transit. So it's, you really have to wonder about that. So the payments for 
right? through technology. But by the way, that's the good thing because in the past, when check you could you used to be able to write a check to pay, maybe you hadn't got paid yet, you can pay through your bank, then it's getting back to your bank. In other words, you would take advantage of float. Today, not so much because you know these, first of all, they're sped up. What tends to happen is when, when you make a deposit of someone's check, your bank is going to be transaction and send it right away to where the original bank is, and they get paid right away. So it doesn't really allow you to play the flow as yeah. you did before. So the payments function is changing mostly through technology, but banks are unique in that they, in that they do maintain wire transfer services. And uh, and this is not the same as Western Union. Like you go to Walmart and send something MoneyGram or Western Union. That's different. That's an entirely different system. In fact, Western Union does not use the same uh, system. It's an old telegraph system. It's been around for a long, long, long. Okay. And then finally, is the private agent of government monetary policy. Now, this is one that we're going to not get into here, but I just want to sort of mention it because as we get going in the next section of the class, because when when we talk about the fact that banks it, 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 uh, uh, fill a, a particularly important role, one role they play is that they carry out mostly just because of who they are and what they do, government macro policy, simply because of the fact that they are what they are. They're involved in tying the economy together financially. And we talk about financial, we talk about money and credit. That's really what's going on. So monetary policy is this regulation of it. But in carrying out the changes in monetary policy, it's often done through banks and by changing these reserves one way or the other, okay? Because these can go up and down, therefore making the availability of these things much higher or much lower. So remember these reserves can go either to loans or to investments, okay? All right, so questions about any of that. Well, one key factor, and this is something that, that is really important for us to talk about, is that of money creation. So I've already covered the bank's balance sheet, what that is, but here's what's going on with, 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 with this, Particular calculation is that whenever you've got a bank that lends money, it's brand new money that never existed before. I heard this as an, as an econ student a long time ago. I thought, no, no way, that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it, it was hard to believe that money creation was no more difficult than banks creating money. But what we'll see here in a second why that is, in, in fact, exactly the case. Every time a bank loans money, it's brand new money. So when we talk about this, we're talking about that. The main assets of banks are loans, but they're funded by liabilities, which then become reserves. Okay, so let's talk a bit about what this process is. I'm going to give you a, a very simple, um, and I mean a very simple sort of uh, description here about. Oops, I just touched something here. Oh no, I just oh no, I just I just did something to the camera here. I don't know what I did. So let me bring this back. Uh, right, there we go. I think I'm back now. So whatever I did was the wrong thing. So I apologize for that. So all right, let me swivel the camera in this direction. Okay, there we go. And yeah, let me tighten that up. All right, let's talk a bit about money creation. Okay. Talk about money creation, what that's about. And um, and first of all, I'm going to give you a very, very simple scenario here. And let's run the turn I guess I can run back. All right, let's talk about money creation. And I'm going to give a very simple example. And I know that um, the reason I'm going to try to make this simple is because I know that every textbook explanation of this is a little bit too complicated, I think, for what our purposes are in this particular uh, course. I really do. I think we're, we're better served by sort of simplifying this because uh, by simplifying, I think we I, I give you all the information you really need. Uh, excess reserves, required reserves. We're going to get to that a bit later. That's really not terribly important. We'll talk about that. So right now, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say that we've got two banks. That ex okay, so it's a very small economy, obviously. So you've got something called the first bank, and then you've got something called the second bank. Okay, and I know that sometimes you've got uh, these illustrations, which will have the intermediary that is the Federal Reserve. I'm going to leave that aside for right now. We'll come back to the idea that the Federal Reserve is an intermediary because number one, it's known as the Federal Reserve because they do what? They hold 
major asset banks, which are reserves. That's what, why it's called that. Because the Federal Reserve does a lot of things like serve as a banker's bank. And we're going to get directly into that after this exam. We're going to, we're going to jump into the Federal Reserve and we're going to sort of elaborate a bit more on what reserves are all about. Okay? So we're going to start with a sort of a condition zero here. Let me, uh, let me just let me make this a little bit tighter here so you can see this a little easier. And so you've got two banks in the economy. We're going to talk about what is going on in terms of the money supply. We're going to keep sort of a running tally of the money supply, okay? So we're going to start out at, at this condition zero. We're going to start with situation zero, right? And that's the, the first situation zero, which is basically this. You start out with a money supply, which is now equal to, um, to $100,000, okay? $100,000. And, and where that comes from is this. And let me just break it out a little bit more concretely here. You're, you're going to have the first national bank is going to have $50,000. The second national bank is going to have $50,000. And so as a result, total money supply is going to be $100,000 to start out. That situation is zero, okay? All right, so let's let's do this first. All right, so we've got what? We've got assets over here, liabilities over here. Oh, this is a little cleaner here. Let me do this. You got with second bank, you've got assets over here, liabilities over here. And I know we've got liabilities and equity. I don't want to sort of confuse the issue, but so we got fifty thousand dollars on deposit, right? As a deposit, and then we've also got fifty thousand as a reserve. Because remember, a bank and a, a deposit is a reserve, is a liability and an asset. The same goes over here. You got fifty thousand on deposit as a as a deposit, and fifty thousand is reserve. Okay. All right. So let's talk about uh, a scenario here. Let's talk about a scenario where a depositor of the first national bank writes a check to a depositor of the second national bank for, for ten thousand dollars. Okay. So ten thousand dollars is a transaction. So that's the scenario. I'll, I'll write this down for you so you've got this. So scenario one here is the deposit of the first, okay, writes a check for, uh, to a deposit of the second national bank. For whatever reason, we don't really care, right? Maybe they bought a vehicle or whatever. Um, writes a check to a deposit of the second national bank. Okay, and we're going to say it's 10000 Dollars. Okay, so what's that look like? Okay, well, obviously they're they're, pay, they're ordering the bank to draw down ten thousand dollars, and so as a result, this goes down by ten thousand dollars, right? And as a result of this, guess what? Some of the reserves, because it's actually the reserves that are being paid out, so that goes down. And so you have forty thousand here as reserves, and forty thousand as, as deposits. And here, this goes up by ten thousand, so this goes up. To sixty thousand, and so do the reserves. So now, what do we end up with here? We have sixty thousand over here in reserves, and sixty thousand over here in deposits. Well, what is the money supply now? The money supply now, from SM zero to SM one, is the first national bank. We have forty thousand. The second national bank is sixty thousand. So there's no change in the money supply, right? So simply moving money around does not change the money supply. It doesn't change the money supply. So we're going to call this scenario one, okay? Scenario one. And I wish I had more board space. Usually I do, and I've I got a big long board I can deal with, but we're sort of hamstrung here by the, the, the requirements of this on video. But, but anyway, I only got one more scenario, and that's an important one. Let's talk about scenario two, okay? Scenario two. So scenario two here is now a loan transaction. And that is a borrower. And we don't care where this borrower comes from. A borrower borrows $30,000. A borrower borrows $30,000 from the second national bank. Okay? From the second national bank to buy a vehicle from a depositor of the first national bank. $30,000 from a depositor of the second of the first national bank. Yeah. This is why I couldn't put it underneath there because it just wasn't, wasn't enough room. Depositor of the first national bank. Okay, so let's do the math here and see what this is. All right. 
So if somebody goes to the Second National Bank and they say, I want a loan, okay? All right, well, how do you fund a loan? Remember that formula here, work funds, loan, reserves fund loans. And so as a result, we take out 30,000 reserves here. And so as a result, reserves fall to 30,000, okay? So reserves fall, not deposits, reserves. Reserves are what fund is. And then it's a guy over here who gets 30,000 more. And so as a result, this goes to $30,000. So that goes to 70,000 in deposits, okay? 70,000 deposits, and this goes up 30,000 because a deposit is also a reserve. And so as a result, this goes to 70,000. So now what's going on is this. The money supply we'll simply call SM2 is what? The first national bank and the second national bank should be accounted for. First national bank now has 70,000 on deposits. And the second national bank, those deposits never went away, right? They still owe them. And so that goes to 60,000. As a result, the money supply goes to $130,000, which is the exact amount of this loan here. It's brand new money that never existed before. So every act of making a loan means new money is being created. Why? Particularly if it's a depository institution, or even if it's not, but even if there's a deposit institution involved in receiving this, because all, you're, all a bank is doing is, yes, they're borrowing from savings, but they're doing it indirectly. Because when you make a bank deposit, you're turning over the money Actually, you're turning over legal title, legal right to that money to the bank, and they can lend it at whatever whatever uh, time scale they're choosing to whomever they like. Obviously, the limitations of what they can do with your money, but they, they can do what they like with it. And as a result, if they want to lend it out, they can, but it creates new money. This original 60,000 never went away. The 30,000 that funded this came out of their own reserves. Now, obviously, if that loan goes down, then, then they take a loss for $30,000. But that's another issue. Most loans don't go down. This is why banks make money is because they charge a higher rate on the uh, on, on this issue than they do others. By the way, we should probably raise the loan amount here by thirty thousand dollars also. So, so loans go up by thirty thousand, and that's an asset as well. Okay. All right. Okay. And then if if their loan goes down, we just simply write that down, which means on this side we write down the value of capital, but. You know, that's that's another issue. So all we're really saying is every time a bank makes a loan, it creates brand new money in the economy. So now the question is, okay, well, banks are, are lending money all day, every day. Why does the money supply just go one direction, just go up, 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 and never go back the other direction? Well, that's a good question. And what's the answer to that? The answer is every day, but and people are creating new money when they take out loans. So why does it go up? It does go up. But it also goes down because every time you repay a loan with the money supply, it all reverses itself and money is destroyed every time you repay loans. Every time you repay loans, this whole process is reversed exactly. And so repayment of debt actually reverses the money supply. So sometimes this is in the, in the government's interest. Would we say that that fourth category of, of bank function is to act as, a, uh, as, a, as an agent of your policy? Sometimes, the, the Federal Reserve can create conditions by which the by which banks do what they do. Maybe they make more loans if they if the government wants more loans out there, speed the economy up. They want fewer loans, they can make that change. And as a result, um, you know, banks will do that. They will they will do it, but they won't do it because they're trying to help the government achieve its aims. They do it simply because of their integral role in the economy. Okay, so every time you repay a loan, yeah. okay. Here's the thing, and it's and we're gonna expand on one concept more, and it'll be the last thing we talked about today, and that is this, it's something called the multiplier. Up to this point, we've talked about one multiplier only, and that's the, the money multiplier, or I'm sorry, the consumption multiplier. Here, we're going to introduce a new multiplier called the money multiplier, and that is the idea that, okay, a bank lending money sets up a chain of events. That is, somebody borrows money from a bank, and now as a result, new money new money's going to go somewhere, it becomes new reserves somewhere in the system. So those new reserves have got to be loaned and invested. And by the way, I can, I can, the reason I simplify this is because this, I mean, we could just go on and on and on with this. These reserves, this 30,000 of new money that's reserved, could now go to loans and investments, you know, all, and, and, and just go on and on and on, right? And as a result, if, if it goes on and there's, there's new money being created, then, then what is the end effect of that? It's the multiplier. It's the factor by which the should change the money supply is magnified through successive rounds of transactions. Loans become reserves, reserves become new loans, new loans become new reserves, on and on and on. 
So where does it end? What's the reciprocal? Just like the conception multiplier was the reciprocal of the amount of savings in the economy, because remember, what's the reciprocal of consumption and savings? Well, what's the opposite of a bank not lending or investing in reserves? It's putting money on what we call required reserve. And so the multiplier is it's one over the required reserve ratio. Now, let's talk about what the required reserve ratio is. We didn't get to this here because I wanted to present a fairly simplified model, but on the balance sheet where it says reserves, these are actually broken into two main categories, required reserves, which go off to the Federal Reserve. And I, de I deliberately did not include that here just because it makes the thing a little bit more unwieldy. I've already got limited board space. But they're required reserves, and then they're everything over and above that become what are called excess reserves, and that banks or free reserves, whichever you prefer. And banks can do whatever they do as a result. When that ratio goes down, the money multiplier goes up because it means that banks have more money to, to lend. This is just the required portion. This triple R required reserve ratio can go up and down depending upon what the Federal Reserve wants to have happen in the economy. So just as an example here, if you take a look, let's just have a couple different scenarios. Let's say the Federal Reserve wants to, as a ratio of 10%, right? So let's say if it's, if required reserve ratio is 10% or 0.1, right? Then the money multiplier is gonna be one over 0.1, which means it's gonna be 10. 10 what? Well, it's really 10 times, 10 times some initial change in the money supply. But what if the Federal Reserve wants a more restricted policy, wants to shrink the growth in money, then they end up doing what? They end up raising the money supply or raising the reserve ratio to, let's say, 20%. So now as a result, the money multiplier is 1 divided by 0 0.2, which is 5, which is half the growth in the money supply, simply because why? Because the Federal Reserve is requiring the banks put more money sort of on the bench. You know, it's like, like taking a player out of the game, putting them on the bench. You can't be used in the game. It's money that's taken out. And up until just a few years ago, banks were sort of a disadvantage where um, they really didn't, they didn't, didn't earn interest on those reserves and whatnot. Now they get paid a, a small amount, not a lot. In fact, it's now that interest rates are higher generally, they really don't get paid very much relative to what they can earn elsewhere in the economy. But nonetheless, the bank, the Federal Reserve was, was paying people banks' interest just to sort of boost banks' earnings. And the Federal Reserve has the unique ability to create money out of whole cloth. And uh, we're going to talk. I know, as I've said a few times before, it's almost impossible to get through a macro course without somehow talking about the Federal Reserve pretty much all the time. And yet, we don't really get into talking about them. So here it is week 11. We really haven't even explored what they really are. But we're, we're just now on the cusp of doing that. And all we're doing is we're saying, okay, if, money, if this required ratio goes up or down, it's going to affect the money supply. Likewise, what if the Fed wants to increase the rate of growth in the economy and lower it to, to 0.05, 5%, then the money multiplier is 1 divided by 0.05, which is 20. So now that's obviously a bigger multiple, which is the, the money multiplier. And so a billion dollars of new money becomes 20 billion once it works through the system. Because new loans become new reserves. Some of those reserves get drained away in the form of required reserves. What's excess, what remains, goes on to make the next transaction, next round, next round, next round, until it gets all the way down to the final stage, which is $20, million, $20 billion of new lending. Okay? So that's the factor. That's the only other multiplier that we're going to talk about in this course. Um, I know there are, there are lots of multipliers everywhere in macroeconomics, and we've only talked about two, and that's all we're really going to get to. But it's an important concept because it's going to come up again later when we get into the policy section of the class because we'll see how this actually works. In particular, we'll see whether or not this is a pretty good mechanism for controlling the money supply because the, the Federal Reserve has got other tools as well. And we're going to focus on those uh, when we come back from the, the third exam. Okay, so we've only got a couple of minutes. Are there questions for me about anything that I've talked about with regard to Chapter 14 money? Money and banking is really the topic of this. And by the way, I only covered just some of the basics. There is a, if, if, if anybody becomes a finance major, will probably take a money and banking course at some point on their bachelor's degree. It's usually a 300 level course, and we get in, in much more detail as to what this is about in terms of things like reserves and regulation and types of loans and investments. And it's, it's really a must for anybody who wants to go into finance. If you have finance degrees, finance or econ major, pretty much the only people who take that course, honestly. But it's a pretty good one, and um, you know uh, you may see it again if you are uh, if you anybody who does study finance at some point. So this is not something that 
it's a one-off. It's, it's something that will we'll continue to add to your education if you do go that direction. All right. Well, that's it for the day. So when we come back on Thursday, we will talk about the exam. I'll give you some heads up as to what to look for, give the, give the details and bring your questions. And we'll go from there. So have a great rest of your day. See you next time.